Good morning. If there are any of these noises from outside getting onto the tape, again, please let me explain that it is due to workmen out on the road, and just try not to hear it. There is a way of telling what degree of progress we are making on the spiritual path. <laughs> that way is not by uh, noticing how much more spiritual we feel or uh, how much <clears throat> better we're behaving or uh, how much more virtuous we are. These are not the signs. The signs of spiritual progress are in our reactions to that which is presented to us in the pictures of the world. For instance, the more we read of wars and the threats of wars, And the less fear it engenders in us because of our realization that temporal power isn't power, that, of course, is a uh, definite sign of our spiritual progress. Uh, The more we read of the sins and the diseases of the world, and the less we react with horror or fear, the greater the degree of spiritual progress we have made. First of all, because In proportion, as we understand that temporal power is not power in the presence of God, there is no need to react to the disease part of it or the accident part of it. And once we begin to perceive that man never sins, there is no such thing as an evil man or woman, once we begin to realize that the nature of that which is called evil is impersonal. That's why it was given the name Satan. Not a man, an outside impersonal temptation or tempter. Then in the degree that we witness evil men and women instead of reacting A smile comes inside of us with a, Father, forgive them, their ignorance. Not their evil, their ignorance. They couldn't be evil if they weren't ignorant. And therefore, you do not have horror at the evils or the evil people of the world, but a compassion, a Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This is a sign of spiritual progress. And this next one is not only a sign of it, but as an antidote for it. It is inevitable that you read of the terrible lack of food and uh, necessaries, of drugs, or all the things that are necessaries in China or in India or in Russia and all of these countries that are so sadly lacking in even necessities today. And if instead of uh, reacting to these with horror or with pity, you can realize 
that it's a lie because supply is spiritual and therefore it has to be omnipresent and there is an infinity of supply therefore again you can forgive those who are materializing supply or who are entertaining a material sense of supply and thereby you not only show your own spiritual progress but you help to remove the lack and limitation because somewhere somebody wakens up to the fact that it isn't a lack of supply it is that we entertain a physical or material sense of supply if only we knew that supply is spiritual that supply really is the grace of God or grace of God is really supply and there can't be anywhere where God is not so there cannot be anywhere where grace is not we would then awaken some of these sleeping souls to the apprehension of this truth and in one way or another supply would start to roll probably those who are holding it here in uh, warehouses and elsewhere would uh, uh, attain some measure of the spiritual light and let loose even of the physical sense of it because even physically there is no lack of supply in the world there is enough in the ground and enough in storehouses to take care of everybody there is merely uh, an absence of the realization that this does not have to be stored in storehouses and bonds because it is the flowing grace of God and then we let loose of it so then in every way you can well you can't apply a yardstick but at least you can note that you are making spiritual progress but only in the degree of your non-reaction to these negative appearances in the world now this involves a greater understanding of God because to know him aright is life eternal therefore the only solution to the problems of the world is to know God aright and while this is at first difficult it must eventually be attained by everybody in the studying and practicing the message of the infinite way since God cannot be known through the mind we have to stop thinking thoughts about God because we will not learn to know God aright with our thoughts or thinking about God this will not bring the knowledge of God well I could think about music for a uh, an age and, and, and never be able to bring through a bit of it thinking about music is not going to make me a musician in some way or other I I, I must attain music well so it is that there have been people who have devoted their whole lives to thinking about God they've lived their whole lives with a Bible in their hand and they haven't gotten to within a billion miles of God because all they had were words in their mind and those words are not God there are no words in your mind that ever become God not even the word God or the word Christ I can tell you that God is not a word I can tell you that Christ is not a word God is an experience Christ is an experience 
you can experience God and you can experience Christ, but you can never know them with your mind, even, even if, as might sometimes happen, even if a figure appeared in your mind that looked like whatever it is you think Jesus Christ is, even that would not be Christ. That would still be an image in your mind, but it would indicate that you were experiencing Christ, or it might indicate that, unless this picture were emotionally induced. Now, a lot of people can emotionally induce pictures. There are people in uh, Europe <clears throat> who each year experience the nail marks of the master in their body and they are treated by the world as if they were mystics. They are emotional neurotics bordering on insanity because all they do is live so in their mind with this picture of the passion that eventually it externalizes itself. You could do it if you wanted to spend enough years just emoting inside of yourself about the passion. As a matter of fact, you can bring out anything you want on your body if you just determine to live inside long enough with the feeling of it. You can bring out an absolute uh, purity where not a degree of sensuality ever enters your mind or a feeling in your body, if you wanted to devote enough time to attaining that. And on the other hand, you could make your body so sensual that it would be a sin to turn it loose on the street, if you just want to fill your mind with it. Because that which you take into your mind with any degree of intensity must become manifest on the body. The reason is the mind and the body, the mind and matter is one. And all that you can take in the mind you must manifest as body. Now, if you want spirit, God, Christ, you must let the mind rest. You must take no thought because it is in the moment that ye think not that the bridegroom cometh. Not in the moment when you're thinking. Not in the moment when your mind is active. Not in the mind when your intellect is being catered to. This is not when the Christ comes. This Christ or the Spirit of God comes in the moment of your humility, when you can say, how could I ever hope to know God? Isn't that egotism? How could I ever embrace the allness of God in my little mind? Ah, oh, no. No, when, when I'm still still in quietness and in confidence when I am listening for the still small voice when I am realizing that God is not a word God is being God is not a thought. God is being. And eventually you will discover that God is my being. For there are not two. I and my Father are one. And as long as I am holding a selfhood apart from God, as long as I am holding myself apart and thinking of some other as God, God is not becoming my being, which God is. Therefore, be still and know that I am God. And that's all that's necessary is that I. 
I do not know what I am. You certainly do not know what you are. Because you were one thing at three years of age and you were another thing at ten and another one at fifteen and another one at eighteen and another one at thirty-five and another one at fifty and you'll be still another one at seventy or eighty. How are you going to sum up what I am? Actually, I am infinity, but I do not know what infinity is. Because even though I can see the Nile River from the north to the south, I cannot see it all because it's always still coming into being. Now, I have told you that the Hebrew mystic Maimonides wrote that if you were to say that God is good or that God is all power, or that God is almighty, or that God is great, that you are saying no more than if you were to say God is. And so today I discovered that the great Catholic mystic who gave the world the cloud of all knowing also said that if you were to say God is love and even if you were to say God is divine love and if you were to say God is omniscience you would be saying no more than God is. And how true this is you may see when you look out at your gardens, your parks and try to ask yourself if you know what it is that produced that or how it was produced. Or when you look up into the sky at night and see these stars and moons and planets and, and ask yourself if you know what produced that. Does anyone know? Has that been solved? How this world came into being? Then who can know what God is? But as you look at this orderly universe of sun, moon, stars, and planets, and tides, and the nature that makes apples come from apple trees, and peaches from peach trees, and that makes two times two four and that makes do re mi music as you look at all this and say man did not create this certainly I know that God is now to go any further than this is to set the mind at work the intellect at work and to set up a barrier between yourself and God because having acknowledged that God is, you are now a deep religionist. You have gone as far as anyone has ever gone, even if they observed all the sacraments and all the holidays and all the holy days. They did no more in that than to say God is. And I say God is without going all through all those forms. And I not only say it, but I do something more than they do. I sit back and let God be God to me. And do not merely keep it as a form of worship in the mind. I get through with God is in just a half a second. And get back into my silence and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant is. In that one statement, I've acknowledged God. I've worshipped God. I've acknowledged the infinite nature of God, the omnipresence of God, the omniscience. I've done all that without saying a word except, Speak, Lord. Because what do I expect God to speak to me if not power, intelligence, love? 
then having acknowledged God I am the most religious person on the face of this globe for no one has ever done more than acknowledge God no matter how many words they took to do it in or how many acts they took to do it in they've done no more than acknowledge God and I've done that and now I'm going to do one additional thing I'm going to stop being me I'm going to stop pretending because anything else is a pretense and I want to let God take over and live my life I am not going to make any pretense to being good or being spiritual I'm not going to make any pretense to being charitable or benevolent because the moment I did I'd face myself as a liar because all my charities and all my benevolences are limited to a tiny little bit never do I give it all away so I can't be quite as charitable or benevolent as sometimes we like to think we are oh no no I'm only charitable and benevolent to the extent that I can let God function through me and if I could let it function through me I could be more charitable and more benevolent and more loving and more patient but at least in the degree that I can I'm making no pretenses about Joel and I'm, I'm making no claims for him and those of you have known me throughout my entire experience in this work know that I have never even claimed to have a good understanding because if there's anybody in the world knows I haven't got it it's I myself my understanding is completely limited to whatever comes through in this moment whatever I knew yesterday was yesterday's manner and it isn't doing me any good today only that which I know this minute represents my understanding and it isn't even mine really it's God's gift to me through me since there isn't God and me once I have surrendered myself there is not God and me there is God functioning through me I live yet not I Christ liveth my life and Moses who was slow of speech was informed that he wouldn't have to speak that God would speak through him now only in the degree that you can give up the intellectual exercise of trying to know God with the mind or worship God with the mind and live in the constant atmosphere of thank you father God is my being God lives my life and I keep myself sufficiently clear that I may always be the transparency through which God's grace flows and then there's no ego and there's no personal self and there's no personal attainment because and you might as well understand this if the infinite way is mine it has its limitations it had a beginning and it will have an ending but if the infinite way is God's message then it is being expressed into human consciousness and it will be there for an eternity and Joel couldn't do this and remember that that has been my particular saving grace that I have known from the beginning that this was something that keeps coming through me from an invisible source and it must be from the true source because of its fruitage nobody has been harmed or impoverished by the infinite way and those who have been open and receptive and responsive to it 
have been healed physically or mentally or financially and spiritually. Therefore, it cannot be of man. It must be of God. And if it is of God, Joel is not responsible for what happens to it today. He is only responsible for maintaining himself as a transparency today, nor is he responsible for what happens to it when he is no longer physically present, because that which sent it into expression will continue to function it. <clears throat> no one is ever going to tamper with it. Never. Never. Because it has no personal savior. It has no personal revelator. It is the spirit of truth itself voicing itself. And be assured of this, that the voice of truth will always have a transparency or a million transparencies through which as which to reach human consciousness. <clears throat> so it is, when you are thinking of your individual life, you must stop thinking of it as your life and begin to think of it as God's life. You didn't create your life. You didn't even create your talents. It may even prove someday to be that the the very exercises and lessons you took to develop them have limited them. Who knows? Because anything that man has added to them has certainly not uh, increased them. But as you begin to think that this isn't my life, God gave himself to this world as the begotten Son. You. God gave himself to this world as you. He didn't breathe into you your life. He breathed into you his life. His breath. So it's, it's not your breath you're breathing. It's his breath. It's not your life you're living. It's his life. It isn't your mind you're functioning with, it's his mind. It isn't even your body you're functioning with. Your body is the temple of the living God. And the more you realize this and the more you surrender yourself, that God may function as your mind, as your soul, as your life, as your breath, as your being, as your body, the more of divine grace will be expressed as you. And uh, while the ignorant will say how wonderful you are and how noble and how beautiful, you within will be saying to yourself how I wish you knew that this is not me you are looking at, but thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. For I and the Father are one. And this can only be when you have surrendered yourself to the extent that you are not trying to manipulate God with your mind. You are not trying to influence God with your mind, not even in your behalf and not in your neighbor's behalf. But when you are accepting God as the being of every being and then letting God function. How are we to pray for our enemies? Well, the longer we see them as human beings, the longer they'll have something to be forgiven for and prayed for. There can only be one way to pray for our enemies, and that is to understand that God is individual being. And the more we realize that, the less mistakes they can make and the less sins they can commit. But the more we look upon them as human beings that are sinning, whom we are going to forgive, the more egotistical we are and the more we bind them. If I say that I have surrendered my 
self to God so that I have no self. That which is myself is God and that whatever it is that is functioning through me is God. That whatever of good is emanating from me or through me is God. Whatever of uh, error is just my inability to let God fully function, that you must know that I believe that this is the truth about everybody whether or not they are yet aware of it. Now how are they to become aware of it? And I will tell you that they never can become aware of it through themselves because the human mind that is functioning them is not going to give itself up. It is only as we pray aright, that is, as we in our meditations realize all that I am, and then realize that thou art, that they can be touched by the Christ which we have loosed in the world. And this can change them. It has been so with you, it has been so with me. In our humanhood, we could not have come to a spiritual teaching. We would have gone on forever and forever in our paganistic orthodoxy. Or in some mental abacadabra. It is only because at some period of our life, we were inwardly touched and we found ourselves turned in a direction which we couldn't have taken ourselves because we had to abandon the faith of our fathers. We had to abandon the friendships, the relationships that we've developed. We've had to learn to have a secret life of our own within hidden from our friends and relatives. And you know, we don't have that kind of capacity as humans any more than our human friends have that capacity. It is only because we have been touched by the Spirit and we do not know whether at some moment or other in our experience we just opened ourselves sort of, oh God. Or whether someone else's praying reached our consciousness. It may have been someone on this side of the veil and it may have been someone on the other side of the veil. Because on the other side of the veil every mystic is still praying. None of them are dead. Moses hasn't died. Elijah hasn't died. Jesus hasn't died. John hasn't died. Paul hasn't died. And none of them are interested in billiards or bowling or baseball games or football games. They are still spiritually alive. And since they are in our consciousness, they can't be outside, it could be their prayers that reached us. It could have been some mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, still praying in what we call the beyond that has touched us. We don't know where the spark came from that made us leave our nets. And don't forget that in the degree that you have left your church, the church of your fathers, or that you have let relatives and friends drift out of your life because of... Uh, these new ones that have come in. In that degree you have left your nets. You, you have left that old mortality. And please believe that you could not do this of yourself because if you could then the four billion others that are out in the world would be doing it. Because you may be assured they want what we have got. At the present time, 
they don't want the way in which we got it because they have no knowledge of that way and it seems dull and monotonous dreary but be assured they want what we have they want peace of mind and they want peace of soul and they want a healthier physical body and they want a more intelligent mind they want a greater assurance of uh, God's grace in the world because they're all living in horrible fear of bombs and wars all of which would be dropped if they had any assurance at all of God's grace why should they fear bombs so they want what we've got and if they had the capacity to go our way to get it they would be on our path and they cannot have the capacity until a spark touches them and that spark may come through our prayers because just remember that we are bringing Protestant ministers and Hebrew rabbis into this so it must be our prayers bringing them it isn't uh, their Protestant prayers or Hebrew prayers doing it or it may be as I said the mediation the prayers of those uh, in monasteries or nunneries or on the other side of the veil but once we are touched and this is our path we must not look back now of course uh, that's pretty easy if you look on it in one light because in this light you can't look back you can't look back anymore on the things that you once thought were pleasures and profits because the degree of the spirit that you have attained has wiped that out you never again can be uh, thrilled by the things of the flesh you never again can be thrilled by the profits of the pocketbook those things can only be incidental once a person's touched but there is still the possibility of turning back and fearing the things that we've always feared and the reason for that is this the last enemy that shall be overcome is death and whether or not you will agree on it in every human soul there is a fear of death oh they may say not now I, I have witnessed too much there is whether or not they're conscious of it there is that fear of the final death sometimes it isn't a fear of any horrors over there it may be just a fear of the unknown or the fear of leaving uh, comfortable places or well-known places just as always there have been people who migrated from foreign countries to new countries and then all the others stayed behind because the misery of what they were in was better than the promise of the unknown and sometimes I think that handles us too that even the miseries of human life would keep us here just because of the fact that what lies ahead is to a great extent unknown and therefore the things that might ultimate in death bring about the fear that can hold us back in our spiritual progress therefore at some time or other we must overcome the fear of death and come to the realization that it isn't death actually uh, it's a transition into a different state of experience just like the worm that becomes a butterfly 
I suppose the worm thinks he dies. But actually he doesn't. He becomes a butterfly. And uh, so it is that we do not really die, regardless of what the appearance may be. We make a transition into another phase of life. And then, when we understand that, the fear of death is gone. Because it isn't death anymore. We realize this. That just as you couldn't stay a child forever, you had to face the fact of becoming youth. But even if that was a wonderful period of life, and I suppose to a lot of people it was, uh, no one can stay there. They must face the realities of adulthood and the responsibilities of adulthood. And probably the most difficult period of all is when adulthood comes to an end and people's children go off and get married. That is when they reach the most horrible part of their life because they're completely cut off from the past, except those that want to still meddle in their children's and grandchildren's lives and make them miserable and themselves miserable. But those who face it squarely and see, I have ended that period of my life, parenthood because my children now go on and become parents themselves. And so I can only be an onlooker into their life. Now what's going to happen to mine? And I know what a terrible period that is for some. Some don't even make it. They just die from the fact that there is no place for them to go. They just cannot drag themselves out of their children's lives or their grandchildren's lives. And life becomes a terrible thing. But if you are to really be mature, you must acknowledge that the time comes when your children's lives are their own and belongs to them and belongs to their children. And you can only be a, an occasional visitor and an onlooker. But you must make a life for yourself. Now, what that life is going to be may differ with each one. It can be in the cultural fields or scientific fields or educational fields or spiritual fields. But each one has got to make a life for themselves. And I emphasize this for this reason. That you must face the fact that you are going to leave even that phase of life. And enter another one. And that you at the present time know least about. But if you face it, you will lose your fear of death. And once you have lost your fear of death, you are wholly on the spiritual path. Then you will realize now that there is, you have no selfhood. because you can't reach this stage until you realize that God is your selfhood. Then you have arrived at least at the entrance to heaven because now the life you are living is God. God living your life and of course you're perfectly willing for God to take it around the world or into the next world since it's his life, not yours. So you see that eventually you will come to this place and then you will look back and say, no wonder he said you can't know God, that none of these words mean God, because none of these words meant self. And none of them meant myself. Through the principles of the infinite way, 
you know that you cannot influence God. And therefore, you have made it easier for yourself to pray without words and thoughts. Because if you know in advance that no matter what words or thoughts go through your mind, it isn't going to influence God, you have the ability now to stop thinking thoughts and words. You will discover this to be a fact, that it is only as long as you are believing that your words and thoughts are going to reach God and have some influence with God that they continue. And the sooner you realize, I'm just wasting time, your thoughts will come to a stop and your prayers will be receptivity, listening, awaiting God's grace, awaiting the still small voice and then that Spirit of God enters your consciousness, consciously, and you become aware of it. In the earlier years, of your experience on this path, you are, well really for the, for the greater part of your time, you are aware of this inner presence. You are aware of it as, as some of you have surely noticed when I'm in class how sometimes my head will go around like that and uh, it is when I am aware of the presence. I, I suppose I know that I'm a teacher on a platform, but I'm also aware of a presence. And when that happens, then I'm no longer aware of a teacher on a platform, and the presence takes over and does the work, and there is no longer two, there is only one. Well, it is that way in meditation and treatment. <clears throat> At first there is a me listening for the still small voice. There is a me inviting God to speak. But then as I get into that listening attitude, this me disappears. And all there is, is that presence fulfilling itself. And if somebody's healed, it's doing it. If somebody's benefit, it's doing it. If somebody becomes aware of the presence through the infinite way, this is doing it. And then you begin to understand that I have this hidden manna. It's this presence. This is the secret meat. This is the meat that I have, the Master spoke of. You see, he too was aware of a presence, which he called the Father within, for a long while. He knew that there was myself, Jesus, and I'm aware of the Father within or a presence. This is my hidden manna. This is the meat the world knows not of. This is the grace of God within me. And as Paul termed it, the Christ liveth my life. This Paul and Christ. And so, <clears throat> to the outer world and to ourselves, there is me, but now aware that I'm not living my life, that it is this that is doing it, this presence, this grace. And Saroyan said in one of his books that I just go along for the ride. That is where 
I am in my work. That is where Jesus was in his work. That is where Moses was in his work when he knew that there was something speaking through him. But each of us, and this will happen to you, in certain periods of meditation, more especially when the work is for others and the world, when there is no more you to yourself, it, it, it completely disappears, and this presence is all there is. And it must have been in such a moment that the Master said, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. There is not me and God. This is God. And that is why he could say that inasmuch as ye did it not unto the least of these my brethren, ye did it not unto me, God. Because the least of these my brethren also is God. But it's only in the highest moments when selfhood, uh, that is the selfhood of called Joel, completely disappears and the spirit itself is living the life. I don't know what would happen to anybody if they ever attained that and uh, maintained it on earth forever. It is an experience that comes. But for the greater part of our lives, just remember, it is as if there was still a Joel, but he's pretty empty. He has no qualities of goodness because it's the Father working through. He has no evil, because if there's any evil that should come through, it's this momentary world hypnotism. So he has no evil and he has no good. And uh, he's living always with those ears open, always uh, in an expectancy. And then whatever comes through is the God's presence and God's grace that's coming through. And uh, the rest of them remains, you might almost say, a nothingness. It, it's, really, it's really a nothingness because it has no desires, doesn't want to be any place in particular, doesn't want to do anything except what it's doing and, and, and what's being done through it, has no hopes, has no ambitions, isn't going to get anywhere. If the whole world embraced the infinite way, it couldn't do a thing to Joel because Joel's already realized that, that it wasn't his and he didn't do it. Therefore, he'd still be the same onlooker saying what marvelous things God has done, what wonderful things God hath wrought. And that is the goal of the mystical life, to where we are beholders of God in action. And uh, nothing is ascribed to ourselves, not even good motives. And as you, as you know, uh, desire, there just is none. Not even needs, because every need seems to be met before it uh, becomes aware of as a need. That's called living by grace. But you can only live fully by grace as that selfhood, that which has a desire, that which has a hope, that which has an ambition, that which has a selfhood, as that disappears, then life is wholly lived by grace because it functions to its end, not your end, not my end. You see, if I had something to pray for, that would mean I have an end. But I have nothing to pray for because I have no end. I have no object in life. I have only this minute to live in which I must be fulfilled by the Spirit. And if I have a tomorrow, it will be the same life. And whether it's taking place here or whether I come to California or go back to South Africa or go to England, it won't be any different life than I'm living here. And I won't be there because I desire to be there rather than here, but because I'm sent. Because I don't desire to be any place except where I am sent. 
and then in the degree of our desirelessness, in the degree of our selflessness, our unselfedness, in that degree is the mystical life lived. And really that is what the mystical life is. It's just the attaining of that degree where you find yourself every day living but uh, not wondering about tomorrow because there is no tomorrow for me. There is only tomorrow for God. But I bring you back to our start. Do you see now why it's useless with the mind to try to fathom God? Who can fathom God? And even when God is living your life, God is a mystery. Now, let anyone ask me for help. And do you see that the first thing that takes place in me is that my mind stops functioning. And I stop thinking. I think no thoughts of truth. I listen. And that lets the presence and power of God through to you. Whereas the moment I try to think a thought, even of truth, or even of the infinite way, then I'm trying to make thought a power. Or I'm trying to make a statement of truth a power. Now, no statement of truth is a God power. No thought of truth is a God power. Only God is God power. And so if you want God, be still. Be still and let God function, otherwise you're letting your ego in. And what's worse, you're making graven images. Because whether you take a sentence and put it together and call it uh, God power, or whether you take a wooden image and build it and make it God power, or you take a thought and make it God power, what difference does it make? They're all graven images made by man. The only thing that isn't made by man is what functions through man in the silence. That he had nothing to do with. So when I'm asked for help, immediately, no matter what I'm doing, thought stops. And then whatever comes through, that is the presence and power of God that does the work. Sometimes I know what it is, it, it, it comes through in a message or words, but 99 times out of 100 I never know. Many times students write me and say, oh, this came to me, I suppose you knew it in advance. No, I didn't know it. I wasn't thinking of them and I wasn't thinking of what message God was going to have for them. All I did was be absent from the body, be absent from the mind, and let the spirit perform its function. Not try to do it for the spirit, not try to do it with the spirit, but to let the spirit do it itself, so that I do not have any graven images. Now, any word of God that's in your mind is a word that you created. It's a graven image. Any thought of God that's in your mind you created and it's a graven image. And if you want to be absent from the body, even the body of the mind, you must be absent from the body of thought. 
And then, whatever God is, however God functions, it takes place. And something takes place out there, and uh, it's a miracle to human sense. It's a miracle. But it's not a miracle that I performed because I well understand the Master when he says, if I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. This power is not mine. This is God. And uh, the more I can refrain from thoughts and be a receptivity, uh, the greater presence and power goes through. Then you ask the question, do we teach this way? No. No, those who are coming here for this instruction uh, are spending a considerable amount of money to do it. And uh, the sacrifice of uh, family duties, maybe, or time. The presumption is, then, that they know what's coming. That it isn't child's play. That they're coming for it. That they're coming to an individual who has lived more than 30 years in this and who realizes that their years of study have prepared them for this. If it weren't for that, I could go downtown and take a hotel room and uh, we have 250 to 300 people present at a lecture. Or I could announce a class and have 200 people come here from all over the world for a class. But I'm not doing that. I'm expecting that those who come here, who understand that this is the pearl of great price, for which they're to sacrifice all, that they can accept this. And I can't give this in a lecture hall, and I can't give it in a class where there are beginners. And so, when you are imparting you must start to impart the principles of this work as they are given in the writings until you find a student here or a student here that can be carried another step and another step and another step until you uh, can almost say stop looking for God. You found him. You're looking at him without shocking them and without making him think that a human being is God. Do you think? Jesus couldn't say to everyone, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. He couldn't. He would have said, Why, that rabbi is going around saying he's God. Neither can you say to the person who has lived their entire life in thought, in the mind, in the intellect, neither can you say to them, God is only present when all of that's out. Some of them get so mad they cut you down. Others get so insulted they run away. And so it is then that I am assuming that those who come for this know that I'm revealing to them the fruitage of 40 years, practically, of spiritual searching and expecting that when they leave, they're going to be far less concerned about what is God and what is the infinite way and much more concerned with periods of each day of experiencing God and gradually surrendering the self unto God, while at the same time using all the letter of truth, all the principles 
to lead those who come. Thank you.